Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. Our book is The World of Philosophy, an introductory reader by Stephen Kahn. And in this video, we're going to be comparing three different philosophers. This is for exam three, part B, question seven. What are the differences between Locke, Hume, and Reed on identity? So this will also help you with Part A, question three, which of the views on identity, which is part four, section C of our book, do you think presents the best argument why? Explain. Okay, so we went over uh, David Hume in the previous video comparing him to Buddhism. Uh, so I will more briefly cover him this time around. And... Um, and then we'll compare him to Locke and Reed. And it was my first time reading Reed this time around. So let's see here. So in um, if we go in chronological order, it would be uh, Reed. I mean, it would be Locke, Reed, and then David Hume. So let's start with John Locke. <clears throat> so he's the first of the famous British empiricists was Locke, Berkeley, Hume. And uh, so we went over Hume before about, um, you know, what is a self? Now the question is, what is identity? What is your personality? And in a nutshell, John Locke is going to say, whether or not your, your personality, or which we call yourself, is connected to some eternal soul or some material background that's another question but just for the sake of identifying a defining person it is the act of being aware of your own awareness right now plus whatever memories you can attach to that act of self-reflection and not in our little section of of what we're, re we're reading from an essay concerning human understanding by John Locke, 1690. So he also said, if you could somehow see yourself doing something in the future, if you were conscious of it, then that would also include who you are. And he'll admit the problem is your memories come and go. You remember something that you did in kindergarten 20, 30 years later, then you forget about it for maybe another 10 years, and then you remember. So were you the same person in kindergarten as you are now? If you have a memory of what you did in kindergarten, yes. Well, then, does that mean that our personality flashes in and out and it's never complete? It would seem so. Um, I will bring in right now that there is that special... Um, evidence in favor of what David Hume says we would need to have a true person understood as being the same person from one moment to the next and that's during near-death experiences people often say my whole life flashed before my eyes so if you had all your memories simultaneously in front of your consciousness then that would be the kind of a true person that Hume says doesn't exist, but Locke, he's saying, yeah, there is a person and that's what it is. And I think his, his definition of a person is a pretty common sense version, uh, but let's just get into it. So page 160 of identity and diversity is the, um, the issue for, for this part of the book. Uh, so, to find wherein personal identity consists, we must consider what person stands for which I think is a thinking intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same think thinking thing in different times and places, which it does only by that consciousness which is inseparable from thinking and, as it seems to me, essential to it, it being impossible for anyone to perceive without perceiving that he does perceive. All right, so that's a long sentence with uh, semicolons and a lot of commas and dashes, but what does a person stand for? A thinking, intelligent being with reason and reflection. Um, it can consider itself as itself. So, and whatever perceptions that you have. So one assumption he's making here, which Leibniz rejected, we saw earlier in the book, 
was that whatever perceptions we have, we must necessarily be conscious of them. So he does not account for the existence of an unconscious mind. I think most people in the 20th, uh, certainly in the 21st century, but after Freud and Jung, I think most people in the second half of the 20th century just take it for granted that we all have an unconscious mind in addition to a conscious mind. Um, now, whether that unconscious mind contains eternal forms of knowledge, like Plato said, and like Leibniz and Descartes indicate, uh, or whether it's just a kind of a storehouse for repressing unseemly thoughts and, and, a, and a source of imaginary images, uh, we can leave that aside. But John Locke is saying that whenever we have any kind of a perception, we must be conscious of it. And that's what he's defining the self or the person as consciousness, being aware of yourself. So he says, uh, thus it is always as to our present sensations and perceptions. And by this, everyone is to himself that which he calls self. It not being considered in this case, whether the same self be continued in the same or diverse substances. For since consciousness always accompanies thinking, that's his assumption, and it is that which makes everyone to be what he calls self and thereby distinguishes himself from all other thinking things, in this alone consists personal identity, i.e. the sameness of a rational being. And as far as this consciousness can be extended backwards to any past action or thought, so far reaches the identity of that person. It is the same self now, it was then, and it is by the same self with this present one that now reflects on it that that action was done. So he's also accounting for court cases where people are pleading the insanity plea. You know, were you aware of what you were doing? If Locke is saying, if you were not aware of what you were doing, then you didn't do it because you are the awareness you have of yourself now and that, that and including any memories that you might have. Whether or not that self-awareness and the memories it is capable of retrieving are connected to some substance underlying it, which is continuous, such as a soul or a brain, a material substance like a brain, a spiritual substance like a soul. He's saying, we're going to leave that aside for now. Um, and we're just going to focus on what a self is. Uh, I've read this excerpt in a few different books, and it's hard for me to separate which ones include what, and um, it doesn't include in our little section here um, the, his claim that he thinks it is most probable that our personality is attached to some immaterial substance, which means a soul. But he says that whether that can be proved or not is beside the point. For his purposes, he just wants to define what is a self. All right, so continuing, that was section 9, section 10, the right-hand column, page 160, but it is further inquired whether it be the same identical substance. This few would think they had reason to doubt of if these perceptions with their consciousness always remained present in the mind, whereby the same thinking thing would be always conscious, consciously present, and as would be thought evidently the same to itself. But that which seems to make the difficulties this that this consciousness being interrupted always by forgetfulness, there being no moment of our lives wherein we have the whole train of all of our past actions before our eyes in one view. Near-death experiences would be an exception to that. But even the best memories losing the sight of one part whilst they are viewing another, and we sometimes, and that the greatest part of our lives, not reflecting on our past selves, being intent on our present thoughts, and in sound sleep have no thought at all, or at least none with that consciousness which remarks our waking thoughts, I say, in all these cases, our consciousness being interrupted and we losing the sight of our past selves, doubts are raised whether we are the same thinking thing, i.e. the same substance or no, which, however reasonable or unreasonable, concerns not personal identity at all. The question being, what makes the same person and not whether it be the same identical substance which always thinks in the same person which, in this case, matters not at all. Different substances by the same consciousness, where they do partake in it, 
being united into one person, as well as different bodies by the same life, are united into one animal, whose identity is preserved in that change of substances by the unity of one continued life. There's another very long sentence he's got there. So again, here's his big point. He's saying, is there some continuously existing underlying substance upon which all of our memories are imprinted, which would guarantee a continuity of our self? because it would be the same identical substance from, from one moment to the next. He's saying, um, maybe that's the case, but the, the, the difficulty is that our memories aren't continuous. You would think if we had our memories imprinted on some, like a subconscious wax, or it, he's, so his, his problem is he's not aware of a subconscious mind. Even though he mentions dreams, he doesn't have this notion of maybe all of our memories are imprinted on our mind, but a part of our mind which is not immediately conscious and a subconscious part of our mind and that there's a relationship between the conscious and the subconscious aspects of the whole mind he's saying well here's the problem we're not always aware of our memories so if i def that that might imply we don't have some underlying continuously existing spiritual substance which we call the self and he's saying whatever the case may be let's just define a person as being aware of yourself plus your memories and then he'll admit, yeah, that there's a lot of problems with that because the memory is sporadic. And he's not trying to avoid that. He's just saying, this is the best definition I have for what, a, for what we actually experience. This is what I call a person. Um, we're going to see David Hume say, yeah, you pointed out a problem, John Locke, and it's an, it's an unsolvable problem. The fact that our memories are sporadic, they come and they go, means they're not continuously connected, which means there is no continuously existing self. There is no self. Um, that John Locke's definition of a self doesn't equate to the traditional understanding of a self as a, a continuously existing um, self that is identical to itself from one moment to the next in an uninterrupted way. All right, so that is, um, you know, I'll read here now section 11. This is page 161, the left-hand column. That this is so, we have some kind of evidence in our very bodies. All whose particles, whilst vitally united to the same thinking conscious self, so that we feel when they are touched and are affected by and conscious of good or harm that happens to them, are a part of ourselves, of our thinking conscious selves. Thus, the limbs of his body are to everyone a part of himself. He sympathizes and is concerned for them. Cut off a hand, and thereby separated from that consciousness he had of its heat, cold, and other affections, and it is then no longer a part of that which he is himself, any more than the remotest part of matter. So it's our consciousness of our physical limbs that make them a part of us. Cut off your hand, and now you can't tell if someone throws it in the fire or puts it in a freezer. You can't tell. You're not conscious of it anymore. Therefore, it's not a part of you anymore. Um... The section 15, the right-hand column, and thus we may be able without any difficulty to conceive the same person at the resurrection, so he's talking about the book of the apocalypse in the Bible when, the, when dead bodies rise from the grave, uh, and thus we may be able without any difficulty to conceive the same person at the resurrection, though in a body not exactly in make or parts the same which he had here, the same consciousness going along with the soul that inhabits it. But yet the soul alone, in the change of bodies, would scarce to anyone but to him that makes the soul the man be enough to make the same man. So here's his example. Uh, For should the soul of a prince, carrying with it the consciousness of the prince's past life, enter and inform the body of a cobbler, as soon as deserted by his own soul, everyone sees he would be the same person with the prince, accountable only for the prince's actions. But who would say it was the same man? The body too goes to the making of the man. So this is going to lead up to his differentiation between three terms. Um, he goes, I know that in the ordinary way of speaking, the same person and the same man stand for one and the same thing. And indeed, everyone will always have a liberty to speak as he pleases and to apply what articulate sounds to what ideas he thinks fit and change them as often as he pleases. But yet, when we will inquire what makes the same spirit, man or person, so those are the three terms, spirit, man or person, we must fix the ideas of spirit, man or person in our minds, and having resolved with ourselves what we mean by them, it will not be hard to determine in either of them or the like when it is the same and whether it is not. Okay, 
What is this man? What is a person? What is a spirit? So a spirit is an immaterial substance. Do, do such things exist or not? That is beside the point um, as far as defining what it is. And a man is a continuously living human body. The body changes at every moment. It's never the same from one moment to the next, but it is the same man so long as the same life force has continued uninterruptedly. Then you could say, well, what if the body dies and then is brought back to life? Um, would it be the same man? I guess you could argue, no. Now we've got a new man. Um, but at any rate, that's what a man is. The, the, the human form with a continuous life, if you, even if you become brain dead, you're the same man, although you're not the same person. Why? Because person is another thing. What is this definition of person? The act of being aware of your awareness now, plus whatever memories can be attached to that. And those memories, he'll admit, are flickering, which leads to a lot of logical problems with uh, the potential to have different persons em embodying the same man, the same body, at different times, you could have one person in, in a human body, the same human body in the day, another at night. Would that be two different people? It would be two different persons, but the same man or woman, the same human being. I guess human being wouldn't be a good term. He uses the word man. That would include woman, meaning just a human bodily form that's alive. And so the question, philosophically interesting question is, is your personality, your self-awareness and your memories attached to some undying, unchanging, indivisible substance, a soul or not? And he's saying, maybe it is, but even if it isn't, we don't need it to be in order to have an adequate definition of a self. So section 16, page 161, but though the immaterial substance or soul does not alone, whether it be and in whatsoever state, make the same man, yet it is plain, consciousness, as far as ever it can be extended, should it be to ages past, unites existences and actions very remote in time into the same person, as well as it does the existence and actions of the immediately preceding moment, so that whatever has the consciousness of present and past actions is the same person to whom they both Belong. And he says, if I knew, if I had been aware of Noah's flood and I was existing back then, and now this winter, so it was published in 1690, so it's maybe 1689 in the winter thereof, the, Tame, the Thames River overflowed, and I saw that. I'd be the same person who witnessed both things, even if I was in a different body, um, occupied, occupying a different soul. It's the consciousness that defines the person. So, um, so section 20 here. But yet possibly it will still be objected. Suppose, it, suppose I wholly lose the memory of some parts of my life beyond a possibility of retrieving them so that perhaps I shall never be conscious of them again. Yet I am not, yet am I not the same person that did those actions, had those thoughts that I once was conscious of, though I have now forgotten them? We're going to see Reed says, yes, you definitely are. And um, Locke he is not so sure. He says, to which, I answer, to which I answer that we must here take notice of the word I is applied to, which in this case is the man only. And in the same man being presumed to be the same person, I is easily here supposed to stand also for the same person. But if it be possible for the same man to have distinct incommunicable consciousness at, uh, consciousness at different times, it is past doubt the same man would at different times make different persons which we see is the sense of mankind in the solemnest declaration of their opinions, human laws, not punishing the madman for the sober man's actions, nor the sober man for what the madman did, thereby making them two persons, which is somewhat explained by our way of speaking in English when we say such a one is not himself or is beside himself, in which phrases it is insinuated as if those who now, or at least first use them, thought that the self was changed. The self, same person, was no longer in that man. So he is saying, if you're not aware of something and it's impossible for you to retrieve that knowledge, then whatever that act you did is no longer, you no longer did it because you are defined as your awareness of what you have done. He says elsewhere that if it is possible, at least potentially for you to retrieve some information, then that still counts as you. But if it's beyond 
all retrieval, and I don't know how you would be able to determine whether it is potential for a memory to come back or not, but at any rate, he's using this, in, what would you do in a court of law? How come you don't punish um, someone who did something when they were insane, even though now, when they're standing trial, they've recaptured their sanity? Most people would say, if they were truly insane and really didn't know what was going on, then they're not guilty. You still might lock them up to protect society, but you wouldn't consider that person guilty. You would consider them maybe suffering from some kind of a mental disease. So that's his definition of a self. Our awareness of who we are now is so self-reflection, something that presumably animals don't have, although some may. There was just a recent report that crows are self-aware. They're aware of their own reflection in a mirror. Now, are they aware of the fact that they're aware of that? I, I don't know. I doubt it. I think only humans are aware of the fact that we are aware. So that's taking consciousness and being aware of the fact that we're consciousness. It's kind of like a mirror facing a mirror. It gives you access to the concept of infinity. When I was a kid and my mother would drag me along to go clothes shopping, one cool thing about it was in the back where all the dressing rooms were, you could open two doors from two different dressing rooms and it would be two big full-size door length mirrors facing each other and then, wow, look, this reflection of me goes on to infinity in both directions and that's kind of what happens when you reflect on the fact of, that you're reflecting, when you're conscious of the fact that you're conscious. Um, and this is what Locke is saying, that's the core of yourself, of your person, plus all your memories and the fact that they flash in and out, that causes problems. So that is a problem that Thomas Reed, 1710 to 1796, uh, writes about. Um, so I'm just wondering here, I just want to check this chronology out because we're going to go briefly over Hume again um, after this. And he wrote this one in 1738. Oh, okay, so shoot, we should have done... Anyway, this one here was written in 1785. But I'm going to read Thomas Reed because in our book it comes right after Locke. So really went Locke, Hume, Reed. But Reed is responding to Locke, not to Hume. And his response is, yes, uh, memory is an important uh, thing you have to take into account when you're defining what is a person, what is identity, but it isn't the essence of identity. It's evidence of the existence of a self but it does not constitute the self. You can have done, you, you might have done something and never be able to remember it again. You still did it, regardless of whether you remember it or not. But if you do remember it, there's evidence. Look, there's a continuous self. But you don't need that evidence um, to have a self. The self is not made of memory. The self is the source of thinking. It's its own indivisible unchanging, continuously existing thing that thinks, that has memories. The memories can come and go, but it is still there. Uh, this is a lot like what Rene Descartes was saying. What is the uh, self? It's an un, it is a thinking substance not extended in space, whereas matter is unthinking substance that is extended in space. So matter is always divisible. It's extended in space. It's compounded of other things. Consciousness is a simple substance. It's not made of other parts. There's no assembly time required. It's either all there or not there at all. You can't have a part of a soul or a person. That's, and this is what Thomas Reed is going to say. So, of identity, 163, the conviction which every man has of his identity, as far back as his memory reaches, needs no aid of philosophy to strengthen it. And no philosophy can weaken it without first producing some degree of insanity. All right, so the conviction we all have of a, of a self. He says that this is just a self-evident thing. If anything is self-evident, the fact that we're a self is. He's saying, I, I can't prove it because it's the ground of all other subsequent proofs. It's the, um, the starting point of all thought. So just continuing here, I'm, it's not that long, so I'm going to just read the parts I've underlined. The philosopher, however, may very, may very properly consider this conviction as a phenomenon of human nature worthy of his attention. If he can discover its cause, an addition is made to his stock of knowledge. If not, it must be held as a part of our original constitution or an effect of that constitution produced in a manner unknown to us. 
So he's saying it's just a fact of our original constitution that we have a sense of a self. It'd be great if we can find the cause of that, but whether we find the cause of it or not, it's a self-evident fact. We are a self. And it's not what Locke says it is, which is the act of being aware of our awareness plus memories. So that we may form it as distinct a notion as we are able of this phenomenon of the human mind, it is proper to consider what is meant by identity in general, what by our own personal identity, and how we are led into that invincible belief and conviction which every man has of his own personal identity, as far as his memory reaches. Identity in general I take to be a relation between a thing which is known to exist at one time and a thing which is known to have existed at another time. If you ask whether they are one and the same or two different things, every man of common sense understands the meaning of your question perfectly. Whence we may infer with certainty that every man of common sense has a clear and distinct notion of identity. If you ask a definition of identity, I confess, I can give none. It is too simple a notion to admit of a logical definition. Uh, so Plato had Socrates address this same issue in the Theotetus. The building blocks of knowledge can't be defined, just like, for example, the letters of the alphabet, the building blocks of language, they can't be defined. How do you spell uh, the word word? Oh, that's easy, W-O-R-D. Okay, how do you spell W? Oh, W. So you see, you can't define a thing with the thing. What's the definition of courage? Oh, courage means courage. Well, you told me nothing. Well, at a certain fundamental level of knowledge, that's, your, that's all you're left with, the basic building blocks. Um, so I, he says, I can't define identity. What is identity? That's this, it's what I am, the self. He'll go on to say that material things don't have identity. They're always changing. But conscious selves are unchanging identical units, perfectly identical with themselves without interruption and without the possibility of being divided. Um, so then, the next paragraph. I see evidently that identity supposes an, 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 int, uh, an uninterrupted continuance of existence. He's saying, I can't define identity, but one thing it requires is this uninterrupted continuance of existence. Hume definitely pointed that out. That which hath ceased to exist cannot be the same with that which afterwards begins to exist. For this would be to suppose a being to exist after it ceased to exist, and to have had existence before it was produced, which are manifest contradictions. Continued uninterrupted existence is therefore necessarily implied in identity. All right, as I'm thinking that, I'm thinking of the book of the Apocalypse, which John Locke brought up. So if you die, your body decays, it becomes mixed with, the, you know, Earth. I guess by the conservation of energy and matter, all of the, cons the energy and matter of your body would be still somewhere in the universe. And then Jesus comes back to Earth, the bodies of the dead rise from the grave in these new forms. Is it the same person? Because if it isn't, you wouldn't be guilty of the sins you're about to be judged for. And then you could, then I was thinking, but in the Bible, it talks about the book of life. All of your actions are written down in a book of life so that the record of your sins is there for you. But still, are you the same person? Because your body's reassembled and um, was your consciousness continuously existing? St. Augustine mentioned the book of life and he also mentions uh, the idea of the heaven of heavens in the confessions of St. Augustine. The outermost sphere of the universe. This was the ancient cosmology which um, Augustine borrowed from Plato and introduced to the entire history of Christianity after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, that we do continue to exist out there at that horizon of the cosmos is where God exists. We ex continuously exist, if nowhere else, at least in God's memory. God remembers everything we, we've ever done and knows what we will ever do in the past, the present, and the future are, are experienced simultaneously out at that horizon. So there would be this uninterrupted, continuous existence of the knowledge of everything we've ever done or will do. All right, but that's just what, you know, this must have been something Thomas Reed thought about because most people 
would have definitely at this time, 1785, said, well, what about the resurrection? Uh, continuing here on 163, hence we may infer that identity cannot, in its proper sense, be applied to our pains, our pleasures, our thoughts, or any operation of our minds. The pain felt this day is not the same individual pain which I felt yesterday, though they may be similar in kind and degree and have the same cause. The same may be said of every feeling and of every operation of mind. They are all successive in their nature like time itself. No two moments of which can be the same moment. All right, so I am not the pains I've ever had. I am not the feelings and emotions, and apparently that would indicate I'm not even the memories that I have. And he says, um, time is always changing. No two moments are the same. Then he goes on to say something which is interesting. It is otherwise with the parts of absolute space. They, are all, they always are and were and will be the same. So far, I think we pre we proceed upon clear ground in fixing the notion of identity in general. All right, so absolute space, no matter where you go in empty space, you can move 100 yards forward if it's empty space. The space you're now occupying is absolutely identi identical to the space you just left. There's no way you can identify a difference between empty space, he's saying. It's different with time, but not with space. Um, in 1905, Einstein mathematically described the concept of a four-dimensional space-time fabric, a space-time continuum. So you can't separate space and time. The faster you move through space, the slower time travels for you. Uh, but at any rate, we're not going to, I'm not going to go into that right now. But I will just say space and time, according to Immanuel Kant, are categories of your own mind. So you want to find what is your yourself, the core of yourself, trace space and time or space time back to its source. Its source is the gravitational singularity at the Big Bang with which I have been identifying the self. It is an indivisible point that contains all of the information of the past, present, and future of the entire universe. So I've said that before, I'll say it again, just because it's exactly the kind of a thing toward which these articles continuously point. I think it is the natural evolution of philosophy and physics, um, but at any rate, let me continue here. It is perhaps more difficult to ascertain with precision the meaning of personality, but it is, it is not necessary in the present subject. It is sufficient for our purpose to observe that all mankind place their personality in something that cannot be divided or consist of parts. A part of a person is a manifest absurdity. So a person for him would seem to be the soul. The personality of a person is just, he's saying that might be a different topic because a personality would consist of all the feelings and pains and memories and, and experiences that you've had. But since those are always changing, they can't be the person because a person is identical to itself from one moment to the next. Um, so he is saying, continuing here, when a man loses his estate, his health, his strength, he is still the same person and has lost nothing of his personality. If he has a leg or an arm cut off, he is the same person he was before. Locke admitted the same thing. And he says, so long as you're conscious of that body, that's a part of you, but cut it off and you lose consciousness of it, it's no longer a part of you. Because for Locke, consciousness is the person. Uh, and what Reed is going to say, no, consciousness is a symptom of the person. The person is that which thinks, and that's an important difference, he'll say, because if you identify self as consciousness, including memories, they come and go, they change. A self can't change, so you're not your memories, although the fact that you have memories is evidence that you are a self, because the self is a thinking thing. That was what Rene Descartes also said. I think, therefore, I am. I might doubt everything else, my whole world of sense experiences might be a dream or a hallucination in, inserted in my mind by some evil genius. But even if that evil genius is forcing me to have these hallucinations where I can't even trust the laws of math, I know one thing, and that's I'm doubting all of my experiences, the, the truth of them. But there's one thing I can't doubt the truth of, and that's the fact that I'm doubting the truth of everything. Doubting is a form of thinking. I think, therefore, I am. You wouldn't be able to doubt if you weren't able to think. If you're thinking you're doing something, you must exist. 
That's what Thomas Reed is also saying. He says, we're not our memories, but they're good evidence that we are a thinking thing. Um, so a person is something indivisible, he says. So our, our memories can be, they come and go, they can be divided, but a person cannot be divided. And so you can't be your body either because it can be divided. My personal identity, therefore, implies the continued existence of that indivisible thing which I call myself. Whatever the self may be, it is something which thinks and deliberates and, is, and resolves and acts and suffers. I am not thought, I am not action, I am not feeling, I am some thing that thinks and acts and suffers. My thoughts and actions and feelings change every moment. They have no, continue, they have no continued but a successive existence, but that self or I to which they belong is permanent and has the same relation to all the succeeding thoughts, actions, and feelings which I call mine. Okay, so these are successive things, feelings and actions and changes. I will bring up this very important philosophical evidence of near-death experience accounts. It's important in the history of philosophy. We see it at the end of Plato's Republic in the myth of Ur. We see it in the Katha Upanishad with Nachiketa talking to the god of death, Yamaraj. This is, and, and I point out Carl Jung's near-death experience and what people very often say is they die, their whole life flashes before their eyes in an instant. So, and then a lot of people talk about reaching um, this point of no return out at the edge of the universe. And many people talk about being one with the past, the present, and the future of the entire universe. Eben Alexander, the Harvard educated brain surgeon who didn't believe in a soul had a near-death experience, he wrote a book about it, and um, back in 2012, gosh, what is it, Proof of Heaven? I forget the name of it, but it was in, you know, Time Magazine, Oprah Winfrey did a show on it, where he said, now this is absolute proof that consciousness is not dependent on the brain because my brain was disabled by a disease that's so severe, it's a miracle that I survived. This is a perfect storm for evidence of the validity of these near-death experiences, the truth of these near-death experiences, because I'm a trained brain surgeon, I know about these things, and I know my brain should not have been capable of having any thought whatsoever, and yet I know what I did experience. So all of those things added together, he's saying this needs to be taken seriously. I agree with him, and it's very important for how you define a self, because if the self is some continuous thing that's indivisible and therefore our memories can't constitute ourselves because they're successive and they come and go however during near-death experiences people say i lived all of my past uh, experiences simultaneously with total totally vivid recall i was there living it and then some people say like carl jung i went all the way out to the horizon of the cosmos the entire biography of the entire universe i was one with well, then now all of a sudden you are one with your memories. You're also one with the memories of everybody else if you can remember them. And then that brings up the Hindu concept of Atman and Brahman. It would seem by that evidence that although we're all indistinct individual monads, souls, Atmans, we're inconceivably simultaneously one with every other soul and Atman on some level. And... Um, so let me just continue here. Uh, page 164, the left-hand column. To this, um, about the permanence of the self, he says, to this I answer that the proper evidence I have of all this is remembrance. I remember that 20 years ago I conversed with such a person. I remember several things that passed in that conversation. My memory testifies not only that this was done, but that it was done by me and not, who now remember it. it what, if it was done by me, I must have existed at that time. Next paragraph, and here's the important one to distinguish from Locke. Although memory gives the most irresistible evidence of my being the identical person that did such a thing at such a time, I may have other good evidence of things which befall me and which I do not remember. I know who bore me and suckled me, but I do not remember these events. So he's saying, even though I can't remember the moment I was born or when I was breastfeeding, I know that's who I was. My memory of that event of those events isn't required for me to be the same person who experienced them. 
as I'm reading that, I'm being distracted because I'm thinking of Stanislav Grof, who was, until recently, which is it's coming back now, but he was the, before they made it illegal in the United States, the last medical doctor to be given a license to use psychedelic drugs for uh, psychiatric purposes. And one thing he did was give people um, LSD and psychedelic mushrooms, people who were dying of cancer. They were terminally, they, they were going to die. So to help them deal with the fear of death, it was said a lot of people say that psychedelic drugs help you overcome that fear of death. So he was given a license to give those people uh, these psychedelic drugs was in the Psychiatric Research Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, but at any rate, one thing he said that after re you know giving thousands of people high doses of LSD, this powerful uh, psychiatric, uh, psychologically powerful drug, was that people would remember their birth. This, these perinatal matrices he talked about. It's very significant for our psychological development. They would remember being in the womb, then the trauma of being forced uh, through the birth canal, and, and that these, we repress these traumatic memories. But at any rate, I bring it up because it's all important to how do we define a self. But what Thomas Reed is saying is, I don't remember being born, and I don't remember being suckled, but I know it w that I was the, the same person who experienced those things so it may be here it may here be observed page 164 the left hand column though the observation would have been unnecessary if some great philosopher had not contradicted it he's talking about Locke that it is not my remembering any action of mine that makes me to be the person who did it this remembrance makes me to know assuredly that I did it but I might have done it though I did not remember it that relation to me which is expressed by saying that I did it would be the same though I had not the least remembrance of it I think most people would agree with that. John Locke definitely um, did not agree with that. He says, no, you, I can't be certain that I am some un indivisible, continuously existing spiritual substance. This is what Thomas Reed is taking for granted. He's saying, but I can at least be sure that I am my own awareness of myself. And based on the only thing that I can be sure of, that I am this thinking, conscious being, um, the implication is what gives my theory problems, he says, is the fact that memory comes in and out. He wasn't avoiding it. He says, yeah, that is a problem. And Thomas Reed was saying, yeah, it's such a problem that it just proves you can't define a self as consciousness. The self is that which is conscious. Whether the consciousness is continuous or not doesn't affect the essence of the self. The self is the ability to think. It isn't thought. That's not how. You, so it's an important distinction he goes into there. Um, all right, so right-hand column 164 in the middle, the identity of a person is a perfect identity wherever it is real. It admits of no degrees, and it is impossible that a person should be in part the same and in part different because a person is a monad and is not divisible into parts. That's Leibniz's term. The evidence of identity in other persons than ourselves does indeed admit of all degrees from what we account certainty to the least degree of probability. But still, it is true that the same person is perfectly the same and cannot be so in part or in some degree only. For this cause, I have first considered personal identity as that which is perfect in its kind and the natural measure of that which is imperfect. Okay, um, but the thinking being has a continued existence, and we have an invincible belief that it remains the same when all its thoughts and operations change. So he brings up this idea of this invincible belief. What that means is there's no way we cannot believe that, that it's, it's forced upon us. Immanuel Kant said the same thing about space and time, that we can't escape these concepts. They're all a priori inborn categories of thought. Inborn into what? Is there a soul upon which they are born? Kant said, well, if you use transcendental apperception, you can infer the fact that you must be a self um, that unifies all appearances into well-ordered objects that obey specific rules. I talked about that in the previous videos. Um, but this idea of the self it's all there, all at once. It doesn't have parts. It's indivisible, and it's perfect. 
Um, well, at least geometrically it's perfect. If it's not extended in space, then it's a perfect point. It can have no flaws. If it has no extension in space, it is perfectly what it is, this indivisible, continuously existing thing. And furthermore, um, it's impossible for us not to believe in such a thing, so says Thomas Reed on the left-hand column, page 165. Thus it appears that the evidence we have of our own identity as far back as, rem as we remember is totally of a different kind from the evidence we have of the identity of other persons or of objects of sense. The first is grounded on memory and gives undoubted certainty. The last is grounded on similarity and on other circumstances, which in many cases are not so decisive as to leave no room for doubt. You're aware of your own self with certainty. You can't be certain if a person that you met yesterday is the same exact person that you meet the, the day after. Because, oh, well, this person looks similar. Maybe it's an identical twin. Who knows? You can't be absolutely certain. And, and a thing, oh, look, here's a watch. Oh, cool, that's a nice Swiss watch there. Then the next day you say, hey, buddy, let me see that watch again. Oh, man, that's a... How can you be sure that's the same watch? Maybe it's a totally different watch. It just is similar to the one you saw yesterday. So we can never be sure, says Reed, if other people are the same from one moment to the next. And we certainly can't be sure if other physical objects are the same from one, from one moment to the next. But we can be absolutely sure that we are the same person who thinks from one moment to the next. And the evidence that we're the same person we were yesterday is our memory. Though he's saying evidence isn't the thing itself. We can lose the memory. We're still the person who did that. All right. Continuing, it may likewise be observed that the identity of objects of sense is never perfect. All bodies, as they consist of innumerable parts that may be disjoined from them by a great variety of causes, are subject to continual changes of their substance, increasing, diminishing, changing insensibly. All right. When that change is gradual, we say it's the same thing. It's, it, a tree is the same tree from an acorn to a huge oak because it's a very gradual change. If it were suddenly to change from an acorn to an oak, it'd be easier to realize, oh, it's not the same thing. He's saying it never is the same thing. It's changing always. Physical objects are never the same from one moment to the next. Um, so he's, he's talking about then a regiment can change over the decades, but you say it's the same regiment. It's just a, another example. So the identity, therefore, which we ascribe to bodies, whether natural or artificial, you know, such as Congress, is not perfect identity. It is rather something which, for the conveniency of speech, we call identity. It admits of a great change of the subject, providing the change be gradual, sometimes even of a total change. And the changes which in common language are made consistent with identity differ from those that are thought to destroy it. Not in kind, but in number and degree. All right, I'm skipping down here. But identity, when applied to persons, has no ambiguity and admits not of degrees or of more and less. It is the foundation of all rights and obligations and of all accountableness. And the notion of it is fixed and precise. All right, if there is no fixed and enduring continuous person, if we're a different person from one moment to the next, well, we can't have obligations. I can sign a contract, and then tomorrow I can say, that wasn't me. That, that person signed the contract. One second later, that contract was null and void because I'm always changing. Um, what about rights? Yeah, I have natural rights. Okay, you do, but you don't exist except for one flickering moment at, at a time. There's a different person at all times. What, and, um, you know, furthermore, what are rights? What are natural rights? It's not a physical thing. So if there aren't these enduring souls, these monads, which are the source of thought and memory, but don't consist of thought and memory, it's hard to think of what would be a natural right. It can't be a physical thing. It's something that stays the same for everybody from one moment to the next. Well, to have natural rights, you'd have to have, first of all, a person who stays the same from one moment to the next and has the same inalienable rights from one moment to the next. Without this idea of a continuously unchanging substances like selves and rights, there's no concept of rights. It's just human convention. There's no concept of obligation. No one's guilty of anything. There's no such thing as a moral standard of right and wrong anyway. 
All right, so th these are implications. If there is no eternal soul, then there can be no eternal concepts or standards of right and wrong. Um, and everyone's changing. No one really exists in any uh, continuous way. And the whole question of responsibility, we're going to get into that in the next section of the book about free will. All right, but continuing now, 165, of Mr. Locke's account of our personal identity, Mr. Locke tells us, quote, that personal identity, that is, the sameness of a rational being, consists in consciousness alone, and as far as this consciousness can be extended backwards to any past action or thought, so far reaches the identity of that person, so that whatever half of the consciousness of present and past actions is the same person to whom they belong, unquote. That's what Locke says. Uh, this doctrine hath some strange consequences which the author was aware of, such as that if the same consciousness be, can be transferred from one intelligent being to another, which he thinks we cannot show to be impossible, then two or twenty intelligent beings may be the same person. Okay, here's one that Reed came up with. He says on 166, Mr. Locke probably did not see it, this other complication with his definition of the self as consciousness. It is that a man may be, and at the same time not be, the person that did a particular action. And he talks about a general who was flogged as a schoolboy and he was decorated um, as a younger officer and then he became a general in older age. Um, oh no, he took a standard from the enemy. Let me just read what he says. Suppose a brave officer to have been flogged when a boy at school for robbing, for robbing an orchard. To have taken a standard from the enemy in his first campaign and to have been made a general in advanced life. Suppose also, which must be admitted to be possible, that when he took the standard, he was conscious of his having been flogged at school, and that when made a general, he was conscious of his taking the standard, but had absolutely lost the consciousness of his flogging. All right, so these things being supposed, it follows from Mr. Locke's doctrine that he who was flogged at school is the same person who took the standard, and that he who took the standard is the same person who was made a general. Whence it follows, if there be any truth in logic, that the general is the same person with him who was flogged at school. But the general's consciousness does not reach so far back as his flogging. Therefore, according to Mr. Locke's doctrine, he is not the person who was flogged. Therefore, the general is, and at the same time, is not the same person with him who was flogged at school. So, Reed is saying, we can prove that John Locke's definition of a self is illogical. That the premises and the conclusion do not match up. That's his argument. Um, now we're going to go back and briefly go over David Hume. Um, so I'll just read the first paragraph and then I think I'm going to summarize because you can read, you can go back and watch the video about the Buddhist concept of the self and David Hume. So there are some philosophers who imagine we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call our self that we feel its existence and its continuance in existence and are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration both of its perfect identity and simplicity. He'll say, but you know what? Actual experience proves that that is not the case. What do we actually experience? A constant flux of sense perceptions and emotions and memories and feelings that are never the same from one moment to the next. They come and they go like actors in a theater, but there's not even a stage upon which they come on and off. They're just, it's this unconnected flux. Um, and that we imagine some connection between them and furthermore imagine that the ex experiences we have of these sense perceptions are connected together to constitute one continuously existing self. And even though he'll, he'll say we might admit that we lose our memory of a thing and then it comes back later, um, at least we can be sure that all of our, the events of our life are connected in one continuous chain of cause and effect. But then he'll, uh, he will point out, show me this link of cause and effect. One moment happened, then another moment happened. What, why do you insert this causal link? I don't see cause, I just see this unfolding sequence of events. So if there's no causal link, then there's no continuity. And if there's no continuity, there's no self. Because as an empiricist, he says, every real idea must be connected to some sense impression. And um, so then I'll just continue. 152, if any impression gives rise to the idea of self, 
that impression must continue invariably the same through the whole course of our lives, since self is supposed to exist after that manner. But there is no impression, constant and invariable. Pain and pleasure, grief and joy, passion and sensation succeed each other and never all exist at the same time. It cannot therefore be from any of these impressions or from any other idea of a, uh, the idea of self or from any other that the idea of self is derived and consequently there is no such idea. He says we have this propensity to form these fictions of what a self is. Um, on the right hand column of page 154, the identity which we ascribe to the mind of man is only a fictitious one and of a like kind with that which we ascribe to vegetables and animal bodies. It cannot therefore have a different origin, but must proceed from a like operation of the imagination upon like objects. Now I'm going to skip over um, to page 155, left hand column at the, the bottom. As memory alone acquaints us with the continuance and extent of this succession of perceptions, it is to be considered upon that account chiefly as the source of personal identity. Had we no memory, we never should have any notion of causation, nor consequently of that chain of causes and effects which constitute our self or person. But having once acquired this notion of causation from the memory, we can extend the same chain of causes and consequently the identity of our persons beyond our memory and can comprehend times, circumstances, and actions which we have entirely forgotten but suppose in general to have existed. So then he's saying, you know, who can remember where you were the 1st of January, 1715, 11th of March, 1719, 3rd of August, 1733. So then a little lower on the right-hand column, 155, it will be incumbent on those who affirm that memory produces entirely our personal identity to give a reason why we can thus extend our, our identity beyond our memory. So Locke went on to say, well, all right, the self is whoever you are now plus whatever memories, and he amended it to say whatever you are capable of remembering. If it can be shown that you are absolutely incapable of recalling a memory, then you are not the person who did that. But if you have the potential to remember something, then that too would be included as yourself. Um, how would you define a memory that's incapable of being retrieved? It could just spontaneously pop into your mind. You smell something and then that reminds you of what the memory that you lost. But at any rate, Concluding here with Hume, he says, the whole of this doctrine leads us to a conclusion which is of great importance in the present affair, namely, that all the nice and subtle questions concerning personal identity can, be, can never possibly be decided and are to be regarded rather as grammatical than as philosophical difficulties. Identity depends on the relations of ideas, such as cause and effect, and these relations produce identity by means of that easy transition they occasion. So I have all these different memories throughout my whole life, but I can so swiftly in my mind flow from one to the next that it gives the illusion of this continuous continuum of consciousness. But really, that con the, the apparent continuum of my consciousness is made of these discrete, unconnected memories and sense impressions. That it's human nature to impose these relations of these ideas. Everything's an idea for Hume. What is a... a, a sense of burning that's an idea of pain in your in your head see a red apple the idea of red and all the constituent parts but what you're actually experiencing and the buddhists point out the same thing is a flux of unconnected sense impressions well, hume was even more insistent on the fact that they are not connected no two things are connected in any way except in the human imagination and that human instinct to connect ideas in meaningful ways is what gives rise to this fiction of a continuous, unchanging self. Um, but as the relations and the... All right, so all the disputes concerning the identity of connected objects are merely verbal, except so far as the relation of parts give ri gives rise to some fiction or imaginary principle of union, as we have already observed. But let me just point out in... Um, he said... He said earlier um, that since we don't have all of our memories immediately present to our minds, he says, but there is no impression constant and invariable. Pain and pleasure, grief and joy, passions and sensations succeed each other and never all exist at the same time. As I said in the previous video, if 
they did all exist at the same time, then Hugh would say, well, there you go. You do have a self that's continuously existing and unchanging. And I'll point this out briefly. According to the evolution of 20th century physics from special relativity through general relativity to quantum mechanics and string theory, which unites the general relativity and quantum mechanics, the past, the present, and the future all are all interwoven at the outermost sphere of the universe where space-time is expanding in every direction from our perspective on planet Earth at the speed of light. And then it radiates back in on these fundamental threads, the strings of string theory with the cosmic microwave background radiation to create this cinematic hologram of three-dimensional objects enduring through space-time. So, for my dissertation, I equated the psyche of the self with the gravitational singularity which is not extended in space it contains all space and time and it also occupies each point of the encompassing sphere um, the fact that that idea of this mandala shape of the supreme universal self so closely matches Carl Jung's near-death experience and Plato's cosmology and the cosmology of of the Upanishads and the Puranas and many other ancient religious traditions and most of which include near-death experience accounts such as the Katha Upanishad it gives us more evidence for how to define a self and I think this idea of this memory of everything existing continuously at each point of the horizon of the cosmos is obviously pertinent to these kinds of questions okay I will leave it at that